Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, um, welcome to SAB Incident Response, real life examples on how to attack and defend. Before we start, let me tell you something. This is not like a fair tale story. This is not the kind of story where the good guy always wins in the end. What you're going to see here, the real examples of my experience doing SAP forensic analysis. This is how the market, in terms of SAP security, it is right now. So this is a brief disclaimer. Uh, no one reads it anyway, but it's very important to put it out there. Who am I? My name is Jordan Santarciri. Uh, my background originally was a general penetration tester, like vulnerability assessment, audits, exploit writing, and slowly, starting from 2008, I started working on this type of big systems called ERPs, making a lot of focus in SAP and also in Oracle as well. Since then, I had the pleasure to work with almost like a thousand SMP implementations worldwide, you name it, like big companies out there, United States, uh, Europe, military institutions, and also with a lot of ONGs in the plan. I work at Vixer. I'm actually one of the founders of Vixer, where we specialize in SAP and Oracle. We have a lot of customers, Fortune 500, and we do a lot of stuff. We do penetration testing, vulnerability assessment, audits, and what this talk brings us, forensic investigations. By the way, we're now expanding to Asia Pacific. Uh, we have a big core in all the Americas, but now we are expanding to Asia Pacific as well. So this is the agenda that I have prepared for you guys. First, it will be like a brief introduction, very, very brief introduction in just for the sake of time to SAP so we can all be at the same level. And something funny, take the SAP word out of it. Um, I have prepared for you three different misconceptions that I always hear about. Maybe you hear about those misconceptions too. Again, take the word SAP out. First misconception that I have for you. We can never had an SAP security incident before. Another misconception, we thought that SAP cyber attacks were not real. And the final one, the probability of an SAP cyber attack is low. Okay, so let's just start with a brief introduction to SAP. <clears throat> the first question that you might be having is, okay, so what is SAP? SAP is actually an acronym and it stands for Systems, Applications, and Products in Data Processing. So no wonder why just people call it SAP. It's actually a German company. It was founded in 1972 by ex-IBM employees. I don't know if you know the history, but those guys were working together creating an ERP for actually IBM. Don't, uh, I don't know why that project gets canceled and they decide to leave IBM to create their own ERP. And let me tell you that that was one of the most successful business decisions in the world. Why? Because SAP is huge, it's everywhere. Look at these numbers that I prepared for you. They have more than 88,000 customers worldwide. Um, they are present in more than 180 countries out there and they totally dominate the market. 87% of the biggest companies out there, the Fortune uh, Global 2000, are using SAP. I know that in the SAP world it's kind of confusing. Some people even call it like Japanese. Um, but it's really confusing where you start hearing all those names like ERP, BI, CRM. It's kind of hard to keep up with those names. Well, for you to understand better, I have prepared like a brief division of both. From one side, you will have the enterprise solutions. Those systems are the ones that your workers, like uh, the HR people, financial guys, will be logging in every day to do their work. And from the other side, you have the supporting solutions. Those solutions will support the enterprise ones. The difference here on the supporting solutions is that you won't have a lot of end customers. Most of the people that will be logging in there are technical. So coming back to these enterprise solutions, there, we're going to start hearing a lot one small word called NetWeaver. We're going to see later what NetWeaver means, but just have it in your mind. All the enterprise solutions that I have prepared here for you are NetWeaver based. That is the opposite for the supporting solutions. Except for the SAP GRC, 
those are not NetWeaver based. Basically, it's SAP that it want to buy different pieces of technologies and start integrating those technologies between the ecosystem of SAP. So what is this NetWeaver that I'm talking about? Well, NetWeaver is the framework where SAP is built in. Let me tell you that it's the most important piece of technology on the SAP world, the most important one. And it regulates how SAP will interact with all the different components. A very important uh, set of things about NetWeaver is that first it's service oriented, meaning that each SAP system will have all the different services running on all specific SAP ports. And let me tell you right now that most of those services that I mentioned about, they have private protocols. They're proprietary protocols, meaning that they're not documented out there. And finally, we can find two flavors or two divisions of NetWeaver. We have the ABAP stack, commonly used for backend systems. If your company is processing credit cards, well, it's there. And you have the Java stack, commonly used for front end. But don't get me wrong, both of those stacks you can find on the internet. So let's follow this diagram here. This is how a NetWeaver system looks like. Again, this is like a very brief introduction. What I have here, the SAP application level, is actually the NetWeaver framework. The NetWeaver framework will regulate how the SAP system connects to the operating system, and the NetWeaver framework will, connect, will regulate how the SAP system connects to the database. So 75% of all the NetWeaver systems are exactly the same. Then the business logic will make the difference between an ERP system or a BI system or a CRM system, but 70% is exactly the same. And as an attacker, if you put yourself in the role of an attacker, that is really good. But we are defending, and if we are defending, that is really bad. Why? Because it means that if someone found a vulnerability for the ERP, well, they have 75% of probabilities of that vulnerability also working on a BI or a CRM system. We keep with some of the basic concepts that we are going to need soon. Transactions. Well, let me tell you that in the SAP world, even though they are improving, uh, it is not point and click. Meaning that you will have to remember some codes, some transactions that will act as a trigger to call a specific SAP programs. You can have default transactions or custom ones. Why? Because you can also have the uh, default programs and custom SAP programs. For the sake of this talk, for now, we're going to only understand uh, SAP programs as ABAP programs, just for the sake of this talk. So what is an ABAP program? Well, first let me tell you, ABAP is a proprietary language created by SAP. I'm going to show you later, but it's very, very similar to QBASIC. Um, also, we have a variation of those programs that we can call SAP function calls. Again, they are coded in ABAP, but they can be seen as API. Those APIs can be called locally from the SAP system to itself, or remotely from one SAP system to another, or from a Python script, Ruby script, or Java application to an SAP system. Most of these function calls are authenticated, but there are some that they are not, meaning that you can call it without any username and password. So before we start with these misconceptions, and again, I told you before that we're going to see like real attack scenarios, some of them even covered in the media, I also want to tell you that I'm not going to give names. I'm not going to give the names of the companies that they suffered these attacks, just out of respect and consideration for the victims. So let's start with the misconceptions. We never had an SAP security incident before. Okay. This is the scenario that we have to work with. Someone hacked this massive company in the United States. Those guys uh, were in the filming industry. Apparently, uh, a domain controller was also compromised. They got a domain uh, admin privileges. Everything that you can think of it was compromised. Uh, the domain controller, as I said before, switches, uh, servers, workstations, database, and of course, also the databases that were used by SAP. 
the f this is the first time that I saw this. This company decides to pretty much deprecate every single piece of technology that was there. It was crazy. They created the concept of a white room. And only the technology that was reinstalled on that white room was allowed to stay. If I wanted to go there to work, I had to leave my phone, I had to leave my computer, my smartwatch, everything that was technology related, you had to leave it outside. I was crazy. It's the first and only time that I saw this kind of behavior. <laughs> so what was the main concern here? Well, the big thing was specifically concerned about credit cards, most important ones, and personal identify information, bank accounts, etc. They wanted to know if that information was actually retrieved. They already knew that they were totally compromised. Someone was already a domain admin, but they want to see if the information was actually extracted. <clears throat> They give us the ERP production system. Why? Because all the credit cards were processed there. They say, OK, guys, this is the ERP system. Work on this. The only caveat here is that we didn't do the forensics of the database. They contracted another well-known company just for the database. <clears throat> so every time that you hear we never had an SAP security incident before, you need to start asking a few questions, right? Can you really be sure? <clears throat> In Java, the Java stack that I showed you before, most of the security audit trails come enabled by default. Great. But in ABAP, the most important one, the one that was acting as a backend and where the credit cards are, let me tell you that most of the security audit logs do not come enabled by default. So you need to start asking the questions. The first question that you need to ask to your customer is, hey, do you have what is called the security audit log enabled? And is that security audit log enabled in all your SAP systems <clears throat> across all your users with all the filters? Let me tell you that 90% of the time, the answer is no. But let's be kind. Let's be kind. Let's assume that the answer is yes. <clears throat> you need to continue. And you need to ask, do you have the other logs enabled? Do you remember that I told you before that NetWeaver bus service oriented? Well, let me tell you that each one of those services has its own set of logs. And for most of them, they do not come enabled by default. <clears throat> Let's be kind again. Let's suppose that the customer does have those logs enabled, even though most of them do not have them. <clears throat> we need to ask another question, and the most important one. It's actually grabbing someone actually grabbing those logs and doing something with those logs? Is someone doing a correlation and look at, looking at those logs? 95% of the cases, the answer is no. Uh, most customers right now do not have the basic information to start a forensic investigation on an SAP system. And this is not an isolated case here in Australia or the United States. Pretty much every single company out there most of the companies out there do not have everything that they need for a forensic investigation. So what we had to do, we asked for the virtual machines of the SAP system. And here's another thing that you need to take into consideration. In SAP, you will have what is called the central instance, and then you have application servers. You have application servers to support a different number of end users. The more users you have working on that specific system, the more application servers you're going to have. Well, there is a caveat there. If you want to do a good job, you need to ask for the logs of every single application server and central instance. Why? Because the attacker can hit just one specific application server and from there directly jump to the database. So maybe three application servers are completely clean, but if you forget that one that where the intrusion happened, you will never see anything about the hack. Once we got that, we mounted the disk and we started reviewing the logs. For your convenience, I have created this table so you can go back to your job and see if you have the logs enabled. That's the complete path. This is kind of like the Linux example of where the logs should be at least by default. So let's review together what this customer had. First, the ABAP security audit log. It was partially activated. It was not fully activated, but at least they got something. Perfect. SAP gateway log is one of the logs that does not come by default. The customer did not have it. 
The measure server audit log, very important piece of technology in SAP. If it is badly configured, someone can do man in the middle attacks and intercept the entire traffic that goes to the SAP system. Again, as it doesn't come by default, the customer did not have it. And finally, we didn't even have the operating system logs. So as you can see, we were really, really far from an ideal scenario. <clears throat> so what is this security audit log that I keep mentioning? This is a quote from SAP. It's a tool designed for auditors and security professionals when they want to see details about the events that are happening inside the SAP system. Let me tell you right now that the security audit log is definitely, definitely not one of the best pieces of technology that SAP have created out there. But don't get me wrong, it's still extremely important to have this enabled. Why? Just for the simple concept that something is better than nothing. There are a million ways to bypass the security audit log, and we're going to see uh, one very soon. So how you work with this security audit log? There are three transactions involved. With SM19, you are going to activate the security audit log. You are going to say to what users the security audit log should be enabled. It could be for a couple users, all the users, or just one. From transaction SM20, and I say this between quotes, you are going to review the events. We're going to see later why we, did, we didn't even use the SM20. And from SM18, we're going to be deleting logs. And you might be thinking, wait, Jordan, that's something sketchy. Why you would like to choose delete logs? Well, let me tell you that in the SAP world, the logs do not auto-recycle themselves. SAP will keep logging until by default it reaches 100 megabytes. If you don't recycle the logs manually or with a script, the SAP system will hit the 100 megabytes and will stop logging until you recycle those logs. The profit parameter that you see there is how you can regulate how much information the SAP will store until it stops logging. By default, again, it's 100 megabytes. And also, I have included a little chart down there that it shows you some of the audit filters that you can activate with the security audit log. Failure log on attempt, um, if the user gets log, unlock, successful log on, etc. So there was the main problem that we hit here is that we have gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of log. And this was just for a not fully configured security audit log. The SM20 was not good enough. We couldn't see what we were needed to see. So what we had to do is to create a parser. Let me tell you, and this is another painful thing, that in SAP, the logs are not symmetric, meaning that each one of the services will have a different syntax for the logs. Some logs, as is the case of the security of the log, are not even plain text, are binary. So we created this parser, and for each one of the lines that we had, we created this table. So if we were at the beginning with 10 gigabytes of information after doing the parser, <clears throat> we ended up with 100 gigabytes. <clears throat> we had the seed, the name of the system when the event happened, the host name, the IP of the SAP system. <clears throat> the username that was used to produce that event, <coughs> the measures from the SAP system per cell, and the timestamp. So once we were able to parse of those logs, we needed something to correlate the logs. We use the Splunk. You can use any SIM that you have in your company, but we use the Splunk. By the way, Splunk even has a, like a free trial version if you want to try it. And once we put it all the events in Splunk, we started to notice something very, very common. And once we know that, and we knew it, the time time, yes, just there we could go inside the SMP system with the SM20 and corroborate the OR hypothesis. What you see in the first chart is something very common. It's basically a brute force over the data dictionary using an SAP. That user in SAP is SAP underscore all, that for you to have an idea is like being root on a Unix box. It's the almighty user. You can do whatever you want if you get access to that user. So what we're seeing here, we're seeing a couple of failed logon attempts until we see a successful logon 
and a password change of that user. The first thing that we did is, hey, SAP basis, this was you? They say no, so we continue investigating. We continue reviewing what this attacker was doing inside the SAP system, and we noticed that they called another transaction, SE80. In SAP, in order to code inside SAP, it's not that you will have a separate IDE, at least most of the times, you will have to log in inside the SAP system. That is the SE80, the ABAP Development Workbench. And there was a problem there when we saw that they were calling this report. That report changed the entire forensic investigation. Why? Because before that, we thought we were dealing with the script kiddie, someone that was uh, like looking at Google with the default password for that default user. But this program, until that time, I thought I was the only one that had that zero day technique to bypass the security audit log. This program can be used to bypass the security audit log. So we were not dealing just with a script key anymore. We were dealing with someone that had real and deep knowledge on SAP. This was a serious attack. Let me show you. You don't have to believe me. Let me show you how it works. What you're seeing here is my Linux virtual machine. I'm going to open an SAP client, and I'm going to do exactly the same that the attacker did. We're going to replicate exactly the same. We're going to see what the security of the train SAP was able to catch. So, failed login attempt, failed login attempt, and we're going to log in. Perfect, we're inside the SAP system. We're going to do exactly the same. Let's go to SE80. And as we are here, let me show you what ABAP looks like. So again, something kind of similar to QBasic. And we're going to execute this program. This particular program will let us execute what is called the remote function calls. Remember we mentioned at the beginning, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of function calls in SAP. You could use function calls to create users, to read tables, to delete security of the log, etc. Just for this demonstration, I'm going to use one that is called RFC read table. And of course, this function call reads a table. You just need to pull the table that you want to read here, you execute it, and automatically you will get the content of the table. Let's see now what this IP knows, even when the security audit log is fully activated. Let me even close the entire session, and we're going even to use a completely different user. Oops. Let's see what we have. We're going to go to transaction SM20, and we're going to even ask SAP to reread the audit log so we can get most out of it. We are here. First, failed login attempt. Second, failed login attempt. We call transaction SE80, and we use the RS underscore test frame underscore call. As you can see, what happens since there, it's completely invisible from SAP. We don't know what function call was called, we don't know the input that was provided for that function call, and we don't know the output. So what do you think that means from the forensic investigation point of view? Well, we had to tell the customer, you know what, you need to assume that you were fully compromised. There is no way to discern what type of information was obtained by the attackers because the security of the log is not getting any of that information. Okay, so moving forward, the other misconception that I had for you. We thought that SAP server attacks were not real. This scenario is a really good one. Um, the Treasury Department of an important country on the North American region gets visited by the law enforcement agency. We don't care who or by what law enforcement agency. Apparently, their entire uh, platform was compromised and they were using that platform to distribute malware. But there is one particularity here. The law enforcement 
tells this treasury department that the tip of the spear, the original compromise over uh, their platform was through an SAP system, a dual stack SAP system, ABAP and Java, that was directly exposed to the internet. By the time that we actually arrived, the system was still exposed to the internet. The law enforcement also makes a very particular claim. They say that this might be part of a sponsored state attack, but they don't provide any kind of evidence to support that claim. The main concern of this customer was at all costs, identify, personal identify information was actually stolen. Why? Because if it was, by law, they had to make it public. The second objective was to understand, okay, what happened? How they get in? And if it was lateral movement or not? We did exactly the same procedure as before. A, give us the virtual machines, and let's start parsing those virtual machines, parsing the logs inside the virtual machines. The only difference here is that we already have an idea of what was the original tip of the spear, what they were using to hack into the SAP system. But of course, we need the evidence to actually prove it. So one more time, the log table for you to follow if you have it at home. Let's see what we have on this scenario. The ABAP security audit log that, again, we know that it's not activated by default. Was it there? No, completely empty. The SAP gateway log, a very common component, very common to see that is under attack. Doesn't come by default, the logs, so it was not here. Mesh server, nothing. We were lucky, as I mentioned before, that the Java logs do come by default, so we, do, we did have those. And in this case, the, the operating system was a uh, Windows, and we also had the logs from the operating system. We do exactly the same. We start creating the parsers to create the logs. And as you can see from this plan capture that we have at the right side, it was very evident that the system was compromised. We start seeing directly their operating system commands. We start seeing the attackers trying to shut down the Windows firewalls, download the shady binaries, and executing those binaries. We even go to see some headers and that's the image that you will see at the left side of the, the, the intrusion. And that kind of um, supported our theory that we had before. At that point, we knew what the attackers utilized to compromise the system. What they use is something that is called the invoker servlet. The invoker servlet in SAP, uh, it's a class loader. It meaning that it will let you call Java applications by its name or by the server class. For example, if you go to jordan.com slash my servlet, it was exactly the same that if you go to jordan.com slash my package dot example dot my servlet. But there is a problem. Each time of that you create a Java application, you also have to create a file that is called web.xml. And inside that file, you're going to say, okay, every time that someone wants to access um, jordan.com slash my servlet, you need to ask for username and password. But there is a problem there. I told you before that you can call it in two different ways. So what do you think happened? Well, when the, the attacker goes to jordan.com slash my servlet, SAP will ask for username and password. When the attacker goes to jordan.com slash my package dot example dot my servlet, it's a complete authentication bypass. You actually get to invoke every single method or every single functionality exposed on that vulnerable web application. One of the web applications that is vulnerable, it will let you to execute operating system commands and also create remote users inside the SAP system. But again, don't believe me, let me show you. First, I'm going to show you that this is nothing Esoteric. This is the entire exploit that, by the way, is available on the internet and is in Metasploit, for example. We are consuming one particular URL, and that's it. By invoking a Python script, you can type, for example, who am I? That is the user that is actually running the SAP system. You can shut down the SAP system. You can corrupt the kernel by deleting binaries. You can jump to the database. You can do whatever you want. You can even do something like this. 
any command you want. You are the owner of the SAP system. So what that mean? Well, first of all, it meant that our theory was right. We suspected that these guys were compromised by this exploit. That, by the way, that exploit is five years old. What was the first thing that we need to do is to stop everything that we were doing, go directly to the customer and say, hey, you need to patch this as soon as possible. Why? Because as I mentioned before, the system was still exposed directly to the internet. It was still vulnerable. They had to apply what is called SAP nodes, the nodes that I give you right there. Patching SAP is a very controversial topic, by the way. And the caveat here is that they need to restart the SAP system for the changes to actually take effect. Perfect. So we're in the right position to understand what happened. And we know now what was the point of intrusion. We need to know, OK, so what else happened? Well, we conclude that, yes, 100% the point of intrusion was this five-year-old exploit. By analyzing the heuristics of the attacks, we were able to see that at least there were three different uh, human beings attacking the platform at different periods of time. We were not able to prove that personal identifying information was actually retrieved or stolen. And that's exactly why you never hear about this case. They were not required by law to make it public, so they did not. And also, we didn't see any evidence of lateral movement. The attacker just attacked that SAP system and didn't try to start hitting things on the DMC or jump to the internet. So finally, the last misconception that I have for you is the probability of an SAP server attack is low. OK. This scenario is slightly different to the others. Um, the IT security department were concerned because they have a security incident in the past, a couple months before we arrived. And they suspected that their SAP systems were actually, uh, were also compromised in part of this uh, hack that they had. but. The SAP administrator said the opposite. They say, no, you know what? Our SAP systems are clean. Uh, they're fully patched. Nothing bad happening in our systems. The SAP security guys didn't have enough tools nor the knowledge to actually prove them wrong or corroborate their theory. So they call us and they say, OK, Jordan, we want you to do two things here. First of all, we want you to do a pen test, because we want to see how easy it is to break in into the systems. And second, we want you to do a forensic analysis. This is the time frame of where we had issues in the past. We want you to try to find evidence that the SAP systems were actually compromised as well. Perfect. Every time that I hear that the probability of an SAP server attack is low, I say yes and no. I mean, definitely yes, if you compare it with the probabilities of someone attacking your cell phone or your workstation. But SAP has a particularity here. Take a look at the image that I have prepared for you. That is a vulnerability of 2002 of that all the SAP systems running Oracle as a database that, by the way, is the most common flavor worldwide are having, except if you are like the super, uber, greater kernel of SAP kernel, the super, uber, mega version of Oracle, you are vulnerable to this. Let me tell you. 85% of the cases that you sit there and you try what I'm going to show you soon, you get compromising the SAP system database without providing any kind of username or password. So what, what is the problem here? Well, in SAP, there is something that is called the OPS dollar symbol that basically Oracle trusts that someone somewhere already authenticated the user. It doesn't care who. By default, when you start the SAP system, it creates an operating system user, and that operating system user is marked as this OPS dollar Simon mechanism. That user, without providing any type of authentication, connects to the Oracle database and only has access to one particular uh, SAP table. It's the table SAP user that has a database user as well and an encrypted password. I know this is kind of confusing, so I prepared this for you. The application server says, hey, I'm the operating system user without providing anything to you. Authenticate me and give me the content of the SAP user table. Thank you. SAP gets that content, decrypts it, connects again with the database user and the password. 
that user, the second user, does have full privileges over the Oracle schema. And again, let me do this real quick. Instead of believing me, I can show you. We're going to attack one database that is called TL1. So for that, in my machine, I created the user TL1 ADM. That's it, I'm just creating a random user on my machine. And we're going to use the SQL Plus. This is the regular database uh, query utility that you use for Oracle. It's actually official for Oracle. And you're going to type this super, super complicated command that you see there. You do SQL Plus slash at target one is the SAP system that I have running on my machine. 1527 is the default port in Oracle in the SAP world. And TO1 is the database that I want to connect. There are many ways to brute force this database. Enter. That's it. I'm connected. I never provide username and password, but I'm connected. But I only have access to this table. Oh, sorry. I only have access to this table. What we did was reverse engineer the algorithm that Oracle was using and we were able to get the password for that user as well, what is called the master password. And once you get the master password, you use the SQL plus again, and now you get full access over the SAP database schema. You can steal credit cards, you can do whatever you want. And for us, as a forensic investigator, this is really bad. And we're going to see what or why. So before that, there is a particularity. This authentication mechanism, you can actually switch it off. Actually, Oracle recommends it to turn it off, and it's now deprecated. But SAP, in order to make it SAP to work, you need to put it in true. If you switch it off, it's even worse, because the only way that you have it to make the SAP system to work is to have an SAP SR3 user with a hard-coded password SAP. So what you need to do here is to restrict who can actually connect to what is called the listener. Once we were able to prove that it was really easy to break in, we start analyzing for backdoors on the SAP program tables. Long story short, and I had to trim the demo here in order to make it on time, we start to see a lot of backdoors planted inside the customer's SAP system. And because of that, we needed to ask a full forensic investigation over all the uh, SAP systems that they were in scope. We were not able to tell because of the missing logs if that backdoors were prior or after the intrusion that these guys had. The only thing that we knew is that the backdoor was injected in dev, it was transported to QA, and it was transported again to production, kind of like in a legal way. So as I'm running out of time and we're wrapping up here, what you can expect from a forensic investigation in SAP? First of all, let me tell you that as I keep mentioning, it's a highly complex and difficult discipline. More often than not, the odds are not in your favor. More often than not as well, the customer will not have all the available logs to you. That is the main complication here. Expect many data sources and entry points if you're lucky enough that the customer will have the logs available for you. And because of that, easily, easily, you might end up with terabytes of information to process. Have a team at hand, and hopefully you have a very good hard drive. And the most important thing here, under no circumstances when you do a forensic investigation in SAP, you can guarantee that the system was uh, not compromise. You can do the other way around. You can tell, yes, oh, I can see here because of this that your system has compromised, but never the other way around. Otherwise, you will be lying. And finally, prevent, prevent, prevent. The full misconsiderations are the root of all evil. I think we are doing good with time, but uh, thank you. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Also, I will be in the conference in case you want to ask more. Thank you. Thank you, John. We actually do have time for one question which has been asked. Is, SA, is SAP P2 
pen test different from a regular pen test, for example, with yes. web applications? And y yes, absolutely. Um, and, and normally people ask, okay, why we don't see too many hackers actually are trying uh, attacking SAP systems rather than uh, workstations or phones? Well, before you learn how to actually attack an SAP system, you also need to understand the business side, okay? Why SAP was created? How does it work? And once you have that knowledge, then you can start doing a pen test. Yes, I would say that is uh, different, especially because if you break something, you are <laughs> breaking a couple millions as well. Well, thank you. Was there any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Give Jordan a round of applause once again. Thank you.